when you finish, are you presenting for us today, Christian? Yes. Okay. Um, because Commissioner Berkeley, Berkeley needs some assistance getting logged in. All right. Um, so is there somebody? But you know is what? I actually just, okay. We don't have to worry about it. You know what? Oh, she has, okay, we're good. She's got a hard copy. We're good. All right, so we are ready to go live. Gentlemen in the back? Yes, all right. At 11.46 a.m., we're calling to order the August 21st Policy Committee meeting for the Baltimore Board of School Commissioners. Welcome, everyone. The first policy that we're going to hear about today is Policy BBB, Board Membership Appointment. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, again, this is an update for policy Congrats. BBB board membership appointment. Uh, the B series of our policy manual contains policies, regulation exhibits on the, sec the school board, um, how is it appointed or elected, how it is organized, how it conducts meetings, and how the board operates. Uh, it is the internal operating procedure of the board. And again, the sections are board authority, board membership, the meetings, our policy development, code of ethics, and appeals to the board. Um, today, we're just on, the only update is policy BBB, which is board membership appointment, which is to bring this uh, to align us with state law. Uh, in 2017, House Bill 562 was passed by the General Assembly, uh, repealing the governor's role in making appointments to the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners. Um, as it stands, the current policy reflects the old statute, which again had the board, the governor and the mayor jointly appointing school board members from a qualified list submitted by the State Board of Education. Um, the updated policy reflects the current law, which is the mayor shall solely appoint members of the school board from a list of qualified individuals. And uh, those qualified individuals are determined by the Baltimore City Public School Board Community Panel. And just for information, I included the list of organizations that are part of this community panel. So one question for you, Mr. Gant. Um, this, this is board policy, and it is just a, a wordsmithing conversion from law to policy. But was the mayor's office contacted so that they know that we're converting this at this point, uh, and to see if there's any additions or modifications that they would request that we consider? Um, no, I mean, we, we did cross-reference cross with our legal department. They gave it the okay, but we didn't, um, we didn't consult the mayor's office. Okay, I'd request that you reach out. Okay. Um, again, it is mostly just wordsmithing, but because it is their, their authority, this is one space of authority they have over the board just to make sure that they know. Okay, absolutely. All right. All right, thank you very much. Moving on to policy FKA. Public use of board school facilities. And by the way, that was your first presentation, wasn't it? it was. Congratulations. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. These are the updates to. And you are? I'm sorry. <laughs> I am Gregory Gamble. I am the real estate agent in the Office of Real Estate and Permits. And Thank I'm you. Nicole Stewart, the Director of Facilities Planning. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. This is a presentation on public use of school board facilities, the updates to FKA and FKARA. On June 13, 2013, the Board of School Commissioners adopted policy FKA and regulation FKARA to govern the use of board school facilities by the public. The policy, the regulation, and the forms detailing district fees need to be updated to reflect changes within the district. Charter slash contract schools school definitions and a general overview of the charter contract school process of obtaining space within a district to operate a charter or a contract school. REO, the Office of Real Estate and Permits, is and have met or 
and we have sent correspondence to the Charter and Operator-Led School Advisory Board, the Maryland Alliance of Public Charter Schools, and charter slash contract operators to present the changes to FKA and FKARA, charter and contract lease rates and guidance document. Within the policy, we had to um, define what a 21st century school is and the MOU and the license agreement between Rex and Parks and the district concerning the use of the, of the community space by the community and the partners within a 21st century school. These changes were reviewed and discussed with the 21st century office. Question for you along yes. that. Uh, appreciate the reviewing with the 21st century office. What about Parks and Rec? Yes, um, Parks and Rec has, has been in, in these meetings and we are still currently um, revising the MOU document with Parks and Recs. And the Chartered Advisory and, Board and, membership and, yes. as well? and along with the 21st Century Office. Thank you. That MOU, do we have a idea of when it will be finalized, um, signed and amended um, for implementation? Not at this time. We um, just got their changes back the other day, and we had a Parks and Rec? Yes. yes. Sure. Okay. Yes. So, um, we don't have a timeline right now. It's the Office of 21st Century is actually leading that. Yeah, it's been in process for a long time, and I know we were waiting for some revisions back. Um, that, to Greg's point, we just got back, and so I, I think we're nearing the end. So uh, every, both sides have been paying a lot of attention to it, so we've been working on it. I think we're near the end, but it's a little bit hard to predict because it's gone on much longer than I think anybody would have thought. So we're, we're, yeah, so we're still using the, the former until that new one is being um, Revised, finished, and amended. Is there a former MOU on this? I think this is a new. This is a, something brand new after 21st so century. No. So we haven't yet drafted the um, the individual uh, license agreements for the 21st century schools coming on board. Right, but I think you're saying was there an existing MOU with Parks and Recs? And I, I think this is you. I think this is new. Correct me if I'm wrong, because it's unique to what what we're particularly trying to address is that in some of these 21st century uh, schools. Um, either the rec center is attached to the school and so it's being encompassed in the new facility, or in um, one case I can think of, it's on the site, but so it is being removed in order for the new um, footprint of the building. And so in those cases, we need an arrangement to agree to how the space, the common space will be used um, um, after school hours and so on for the rec partners. So it's in those particular situations, so I don't, I, I'm sure we had probably MOUs for individual schools and so on where they shared facilities, but there wasn't an overarching MOU you. So we had one previously that we are now going back and revising, if you recall. We did have an overarching one? We had one that was previously approved, but remember we discussed how we would make what the oh, necessary changes Yes, were. I'm sorry, you're right. One for 21st century. Yes. Yes, there, there is an existing one for 21st century that we're making changes to. Um, Yes, sorry, I forgot about that. Thank you, Nicole. So, but and then prior to that, that one is really addressing this kind of new situation with 21st right. century, yes. and there are challenges with it. That one also was in the works for a long time. There are some challenges with it in terms of its ability to be, to be implemented. So we've been working on working through some of those issues. Local community. Organizations, civic groups, use our facilities for regular meetings. And what we're proposing is that they'll be able to use our facilities for those regular meetings without having to present us with a certificate of liability insurance. Many of these groups have challenges in obtaining funding to be able to purchase insurance coverage to utilize our schools for their regular meetings due to their size. This will give these groups the use of the space within their neighborhood to hold their regular meetings. It's um, currently, right now, the policy reads that anyone utilizing our schools must provide us with a certificate of liability insurance. And this is a big like hindrance to those little small like neighborhood groups in order to use our facilities. So do we then, as a school system, bear the liability of any accidents or injuries that may take place during their event? 
uh, just for just for the meeting, yes. But if they wanted to have an event, then they would have to follow the normal procedures. Like if they want to have a fundraiser or anything like that, then they would have to, then they would have to go out and get the one-day policy for that. Um, this is a policy that Parks and Recs currently uses now. If you're using a pavilion or one of their facilities, you do not have to obtain a certificate of liability insurance unless you rent like a moon bounce or something. And so part of uh, this change is for us to facilitate access to our schools for our community, these small community groups who would otherwise be hindered by this uh, cost for liability insurance. I see that and I, and I appreciate that. It just mm -hmm. feels like it exposes us mm -hmm. to an undue amount of risk. Um, so wondering if there can't be a statement in the MOU of we're not requiring this, but we're also not owning this. So in the MOU, we're not requiring you to have an insurance um, liability insurance, but we're also not responsible for what happens when we're not present. You know. So I'm not. So we can ask legal for I mean, sure I, I, about I how, how effective how that, works, that would be. Whether like that we're would. open to a whole lot of risk. So the challenge is. So I, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in this area, we're self-insured through the city. So it's the city's liability. I mean, the city is self-insured in this area. So I, you know, we've talked with Parks and Recs. I think we probably should, to your point, talk to the city solicitor's office to make sure that they're comfortable with us making this change. It is aligned with the Rec and Parks Department how they lease their space. Mm -hmm. So presumably, the city has been comfortable with that level of risk for rec and parks so but we should I think make sure that they're aware that if, if I'm right that we're self-insured through the city that they're aware that we're contemplating this change and because it is also liability. encompasses mm -hmm. facility like the community spaces in 21st century schools possible other field other building spaces the the square footage is significantly larger than park and rec by itself I mean if we look at the totality of the portfolio um, and the diversity of possible usages or clients we've got you know kitchens and stoves and 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 things like that that I, I'm not against it I just would like some more information to make sure that we are not overexposing ourselves no it's a good flag it is a much larger universe of buildings and space and types of spaces you're right so we should make sure that um, that everybody's comfortable with that level of risk yes we would check really yes background checks all before and after care programs and summer camps must have their background check performed by the Office of Human Capital Pre-Employment Division. Users who hold state child care licenses are exempt. Changes were reviewed and discussed with Human Capital Pre-Employment Office and the Maryland, Maryland State Office of Child Care and Licensing. All amusement ride operators, including Moon Bounce, must provide a certificate of liability insurance naming the board, the mayor, and city council as additional insureds. This will be added to the regulation. And the fee table has been updated to clarify how and when changes for personnel are added to a permit request, what fees only apply to only permits, and how groups having church slash worship services in our schools are charged. Question related to the fee table. Um, yes. I, I just lost the slide. It, um, because it's not included as um, an appendix that I could see. Um, do we have an actual usable, community friendly? Here are all the public spaces indoor, outdoor, with kitchen, with running water, kind of a source, sort guide for community organizations. I want to hold my annual meeting someplace. I can go to City Schools website and say, I'd like a space with a gym facility and a kitchen inside and outside. And I can sort and figure that out wh where those spaces are around the city and then know very clearly in that table this is how much it's going to cost to rent if there's a cost associated with it or the requirements if there's something unusual about you know only between 9 and 10 p.m. is this available, those kinds of things. Is there an easily sortable dashboard that the community can access? No. So what we do have is a fee table with um, the costs uh, required for um, different um, needs associated with uses. So uh, I think you might have the fee table in one of the attachments. Okay. 
But essentially, right now, and I think we'll get into this a little later, regardless of whether or not you want to uh, use the building for classrooms or gym, the fee is the same. What we don't have, so we do have that, and then as a part of the fee table, the additional cost for, say, if you need police at the event, depending on the um, event size, whether or not you need a custodian. So those fees are outlined clearly on our website. What we don't have is a database of all the amenities within each building. Restriction, so is it, and, and again, I, I see now that it's in attachment two, and I apologize. Um, but are there lists of requirements of when you need a police officer, when you must hire a custodian? Uh, that for the police officer, that's determined by the chief of school police. Once we find out what the event is, we notify school police, and then they get back and back with us, and then they let us know how many officers, if any, need need to be at that event. And uh, the same thing with custodians, that's based on the school, because there are some events where the custodian is already on duty, or in some cases where the custodian must work overtime. That's, that's for the school principal to, to actually indicate on the application, since each school is different, and we don't know when that custodian is on or when they're actually off. Thank you. We also will be making various changes to the application form one to allow for an easier application process for both the user and the school. You have any questions or comments? Um, on the regulation statements on page four out of ten. One of the definitions is a, a new school initiative, and I'm just, I was just curious about that. Are we still calling them new schools? And There is one school that still categorizes as a new school initiative, uh, which is um, New Song Academy. Okay. Just making sure that... It's the last one. And yes. then will that phase out? Does they have wanted to stay with that designation, so we have kept them that way. Um, they have contemplated at times con um, transitioning to another designation like charter, but they have kept with that status. Okay. Um, let me finish this one and then so also then under definitions um, letter P it says no private events such as weddings etc um, are allowed to happen on school buildings I'm wondering if this isn't a possible missed revenue source we have facilities like the great kids farm um, BSA that are beautiful facilities that might really well lend themselves to things like hosting weddings or or gatherings um, and are we missing out on a revenue stream there so this is something that we've discussed as we've uh, put this together and thought about changes uh, to the policy and to the earlier point, how do we increase access? So currently right now for those kinds of uses, uh, someone can request a board waiver. And so that is currently what we do. And based on um, some of the discussions we've had, we think that that is still the way that we should um, review on a case-by-case -case basis those kinds of requests for those kinds of but private I, events. So, so that's, so I mean, I hear you that there's that waiver process. I do think, from what you're asking about in terms of as a revenue source, I think the fee structure that we have doesn't really um, meet what like what you would normally pay for a space like you know one of our new buildings or right. or um, the BSA for a, um, for a wedding event. So I think if if we are seriously saying that if people apply for a waiver that we would mm -hmm. contemplate it for a wedding, then I think that we need to think through what the fee structure would be, because I don't think the fee structure really where um, is associated with the kind of um, yeah. cost usually associated with that, and the wear and tear on buildings. I mean, one of the challenges we've had is that, you know, there was a, there was a, a very co a live conversation about that that occurred with Rec and Parks, because their policy allows them to uh, rent out rec facilities at a, quite a low rate um, for things like birthdays and weddings. The rate was so low that it seemed like for our new facilities, the amount of wear and tear that it would cause to our buildings, it just didn't didn't, we didn't think we could really sustain that 
um, that type of um, wear and tear in our new buildings. Um, and so if we were going to do it, I think we really would have to contemplate what is the right rate to make it worthwhile. It's a whole other area of business, too, and um, it's a very small office. So if we're really going to start doing that, I think we have to think through our business model and how we're going to do that and whether we, um, we think it's worth it. But you're right. We do have venues like I mean, Great Kids Farms, and we were just there for a staff retreat recently. It's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be places where it makes sense. I just think we'd have to think carefully about it, how we would price it, whether or not we need more support to kind of handle that type of work. And then the other piece that, that I, it's, it just seems like sort of a missing hole um, in the policy, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a different policy, I'm not sure, is about more of our outside of park and rec, our more long-term partners with these spaces. People who you know, have been using this space, like we mentioned in the feasibility study for Coleman, the Holistic Life Foundation has a room there now. Is that considered space? And if they do, if they paint the room, if they put up you know, pretty pictures and mirrors that are permanent, is that, is that a benefit to us? Is there a procedure for that? Um, do they then own that room for perpetuity? What, you know, do we have an idea how we do more of those longer term partnerships through policy? For those longer term partnerships, um, we actually would put them on an MOU that would actually address all that. And um, they wouldn't own the space, but they would have priority use over the space for that time that they're going to be in there. And with partnerships like that, we normally start them on a permit first because it's easier to get someone off of a permit in case the relationship sours. Um, everyone might be really, you know, nice when you first come in, but two, three weeks, a month later, now they're just button heads. So on a permit, it's easier just to cancel it and let everybody go their separate ways than on an MOU, because now we gotta wait the 30 days or 90 days, or then we have, now we have to get legal involved, so we normally wait you know, we, we try them out on a permit, and once that once once that relationship blossoms, then we'll you know at at the school's request, we can transition them to an MOU where where we actually will like indicate what the district would do, what the school would do, what the partner would do, so everything's in writing. And so I would just add to on the previous point about whether or not we, you know. Uh, you know, privatize some of our spaces is that all of these requests, permit, MOU, they have to be approved and supported by school principals. So in terms of whether or not we uh, have a policy that makes these spaces available for these kinds of uses, it's still going to be uh, the principal who ultimately decides um, what goes on in their building. So what about competing permit requests? Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner it's... Fedden and I both put in a permit, we both want the same space. How's that decided from a policy standpoint? It's on a it's it's on a first come first serve basis by by the school. So whoever gets their permit request in first at the school and gets it signed by the principal, they 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 have the right to to that space. If somebody comes or by, based on uh, program programming that's already happening in the school, the school schedule, all of those are factored in to the decision of the principal to decide whether or not they yes okay makes sense. Yes, it's 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 before it comes to us. The principal has has to decide, to, or to make sure that there are no like conflicts that that there is no other group using that space. Every once in a while, we get that when they you know that we do get like when it's like space is scheduled for two different events, but that's rare. But but everything is is on a first come first serve basis. But this whole conversation is relevant too to conversations we've been having about um, things like fields as well mm -hmm. recently. So fields too, we approach it the same way as kind of first come first serve. And we had, do have relationships where kind of an organic relationship or partnership with a partner kind of develops over time, where a partner is does is permitting space for you know large periods of time. Um, and as Greg said, we always start it with a permit, but mm -hmm. develops relationships with the principal, with the school, either offering you know services, sometimes offering yes. part partnership on, you know, maybe um, sports programming or sports equipment um, and maintenance of the field. And then over time, might that might turn into an MOU, which then also might expand in terms of, again, the types of relation, the type of relationship that might be there in terms of replacement of a field or, um, or, you know, a higher level of services to the schools. So that because of the, um, in the policy, it talks about making fields available to, um, to youth sports organizations um, for free, because I think 
think the board policy was really trying to um, make sure that our students have access to to sports opportunities in the city. I mean, cities are kind of notorious for not often not having as many um, athletic opportunities for students, and so in order to use our, our schools to help facilitate that, the policy indicates that the field should be made available for free um, to partners who want to, to youth sports, um, a nonprofit youth sports partners who want to offer um, services to students um, for free. But so then one question is when that kind of expands to a longer term use or a longer term partnership, um, how do we handle that? And what we've done to date is we've handled it on a first come first serve basis. And then uh, to Greg's point, we start as a permanent and then it kind of grows to an MOU and sometimes a longer MOU if there really is a, a burgeoning partnership with a lot of um, a benefit to our students. So the, the process starts with the school principal, but no school principal or school is approving. They can't approve um, the use of their buildings on their own. It has to go through the process that's listed here in this policy. Well, they approve the 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 initial um, um, to say whether or not the space is available yes, if, they, exactly. if, if it's okay if, with, with whatever's happening in the school exactly. but then it goes through um, our offices here yes. to, to kind of process to secure all of that yes. that's fine yeah. and thank you for the work on this I have a question about the wireless application what is that what is the wireless application is that, that is for the um, the telecom companies that have their equipment on on the very school roofs so or buildings, yes. So like a Sprint. Like Sprint They might mobile, have a guys. tower on top of one of our buildings. And so I think in that area, too, I think that's another area where we have questions about whether, um, so just, I'm mean, going to just go back for a second to the fields. I think there are, we would like guidance from the board if there's anything we want to change in the board policy to change the way we approach it. it. Historically, again, pursuant to the spirit, what we believe was the spirit of the policy, to generally make our fields free, uh, our, our, our field space free, we've been starting uh, on a first come, first serve basis as a permit and then evolving it to an MOU. You know, there are, you know, reasonable people could argue that maybe we should be doing it as an RFP. Sometimes that transition to an RFP is a little bit difficult because, again, often these relationships are developed over time. So in some ways, it, it seems a little challenging to, after years of, uh, of a partner who comes in as the only entity partnering with a school, providing supports to a school, then later to do an RFP to open it up to kind of the highest bidder seems a little bit of um, not negotiating good faith if you have somebody who on their own kind of came in and were working with the school. But so that's a question to the board is if there's there's a different way we should think about that. And then similarly on the telecom, um, I think we have recently been doing more analysis of um, other contracts in other cities where you see people using um, roof space for cell towers. And then I think also we're looking at um, things like solar panel use. And I think there are legitimate questions about whether we're really getting a fair market value out of that and whether we should be kind of taking a pause and then approaching that in a different way. And to me, that's different than feels because this is not, there's not a, a common good per se. There's not a student. A student. Um, I mean, there's arguably maybe a common good, but there's not a student benefit to it. In this case, these are for-profit companies who are, you know, utilizing our space. And so, to me, that's a more clear-cut case of we should be making sure that, for the benefit of our students, that we're getting a fair market value out of that. And so, I think we might need to contemplate changes to how we approach this in order to make sure that we're doing that. I would also add that there are differences in demand for different fields. There are fields in different conditions. And so that should be a part of our consideration for, you know, perhaps there's some way for us to move this forward where we're addressing these inequities across uh, different fields and different neighborhoods. Yeah, some sort of a, a tiered fee system for the high demands, but ensuring that the revenues go to improve and enhance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maintain. Um, one last question from me, and that is under policy standards, Roman numeral three, letter L, it currently says um, that private fundraising, alcohol, and gambling are, are, are banned from happening. Um, do we want to support principals in their ability to decline permit applications by also including a, a sort of an ethics statement? Um, we support nonprofit organizations that align with the beliefs of city schools. Um, you know, I'm thinking that uh, my community hate group could want to come in and have a meeting space and there's nothing in this policy that allows a principal to say, 
actually, per policy, I can't have you here. So then it becomes a, a, a wiggle room space that I think might put principals in a bad position with their communities. Uh, we can check with legal to see what that might look like or whether or not we can do something like right. that. Yeah, again, I, and I don't, not, I'm not the legal minds. Um, it just feels like, as a principal myself, I would want to be able to say, oh, sorry, I can't do this because of policy, not because of, you know, your racist beliefs right. or... I, I will say that my sense is that our principals feel very okay with saying no to things that they don't... Okay, all right. Well, I just want to make sure they're protected in that so that it doesn't have to be. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I will chat with the board at the update on the policy committee about getting some board guidance and having a conversation around around some of this. Um, so thank you for your work on this and pulling that highlighted out for us. Okay. okay well, thank you. Policy KGF product endorsement. Good morning again. Um, Courtney Desabay, Special Assistant to the Chief Financial Officer, and I'm presenting Policy KGF, Product Endorsement Policy. Um, so the background, the purpose of the policy is to uh, really prohibit or restrict the use of city schools, imagery, likeness, properties, etc., for the purpose of commercial or personal gain, and also to make sure that um, is there, I'm, excuse me, is there a way to turn uh, his mic up some so that we can hear a little bit better? I'll, it's, it's more me than the mic. I think I'm a little too soft-spoken sometimes. All right. No, you're just, you're battling with the party outside. Okay. <laughs> Sing along with it, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the purpose of the policy is essentially to restrict or... Um, prohibit the use of city schools imagery, pictures, uh, properties, etc., for the purpose of commercial or personal gain. Um, the challenge or the reason why we have this is that, or we're proposing that there is no current policy um, with regards to this issue, so um, we want to put something in place. The planned engagements, the stakeholder engagements, uh, so far we have, we will be reaching out to PCAB, the Charter Advisory Board, Pazaza, um, since there is a principal element to this as well. And if you have any other recommendations for groups that you may um, suggest for us to reach out to, we'd like to those as well. I will say that we did receive some feedback um, that we declined. Uh, one suggestion was that we reach out to some of our, our partners or some of the, the corporations who work with us or you know vendors and so forth. And we kind of thought that was contrary to the purpose of the policy. Um, it didn't seem you know to make a lot of sense necessarily to reach out to these partners about a policy governing our interaction with these partners. I think it's something that we make a determination of ourselves um, without bias or input from those partners. Um, so that's one that we, we had excluded thus far. But if you have any other suggestions for um, people or groups that we should reach out to, we'd be happy to take those. I would recommend to include being in the digital age, um, student groups, mm -hmm. um, the Associated Student Congress perhaps, or any of the student groups to get their input because they're constantly, even our media, our media team could provide some sort of um, input because they're constantly using um, images and things like that. So perhaps we could get their input to further the development of this policy. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very valid. Um, so the summary of the policy, City Schools does not permit its name, logo, written materials, or identifiable visual images of its properties to be copied, excerpted, republished, hypertext linked to a website, or otherwise used for any commercial purpose including advertising or to suggest any endorsement or sponsorship of any third-party product or service without the prior written approval of the CEO or designee. Um, so the next uh, slide after this, we have the, the notable waivers. So exceptions may include donor gifts, grants, or educational purposes. We don't want to um, exclude any partnerships or donors or you know any partners that we're working with necessarily, or include, I should say, in the restrictions of this policy. 
Uh, second, we have a waiver may be granted for institutional goodwill. Advertising clearly regarded as being in the best interest of city schools. And if there's any doubt as to whether the use of city schools properties will contribute to the best interest of city schools or its students, we're saying that we, we hedge on the safe side and the permission is withheld. Um, the third is that the policy does not apply to formal marketing agreements approved by city schools. So any agreed marketing um, you know, arrangement that we have, it would not, this policy would not apply to that. Um, next steps would be to engage the stakeholders that we had listed, including the recommended uh, stakeholders by the board, um, to incorporate any of those changes or pertinent feedback that we receive into the policy and some modifications. We've already started receiving some feedback from, um, from the legal department in terms of the wording of the policy and how it's stated and making sure the purpose is tight and it meets with the, with the intention. So we'll incorporate some of that feedback as well. The uh, communication plan, uh, since it's relating to school leaders, we think they would be notified uh, directly. Usual, the usual route for this is the leadership action updates. We have engaged the communications department uh, in terms of a more holistic approach and how we would want to communicate this policy going forward and who needs to be spoken to about this policy or how it needs to be broadcast or, or distributed and so forth. So we're going to work with the communications department on that as well. That's it. So I have two general questions. One, um, what about things like product placement? Like we have soda machines and they're by Pepsi or they're by Coke and we're getting some kickback on that. Right. So, so is that addressed at all here? No, it is not. So this policy governs how um, our imagery and likeness is used. So what, what you're referring to is more on the advertising side of things. So what imagery of other entities would be in our schools or how that would be governed. So that's a different, you know, sort of a different leg of this. Um, but it's not covered in this policy. This is, if they were to say city schools supports or city schools use city schools image to advertise their product, that's what this covers, but not the other way around. Does that kind of make sense? It, it does. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little unclear in even reading the regulations okay. and the policy itself. That I think the preamble just needs to really clearly address that, because it also made me question: What about school naming? Well, you know, okay. can we have the MeQ Middle School? Um, and there's nothing in the school naming policy about product names. Okay. Or calling them charters. <laughs> um, so I just so if that is the this narrower scope of this policy, I think that just needs to be really clearly okay. articulated. So we could be more explicit with that in, um, the, in the purpose. As well as the possibility of highlighting maybe we need to look at, at the other crosswalk policies around product placement and product endorsement that would be more about about branding right. from an external okay. partner. Anything else? All right. Thank you good? All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to athletics, JJIC, Academic Eligibility for Interscholastic Athletics. Welcome, Ms. Bird. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Sarah Warren, the Executive Director for Whole Child Services and Support. And Tiffany Bird, Coordinator of Athletics. We're here this morning to, or I guess it may be afternoon now at this point. Tiffany uh, to needs to be really loud. Okay, to present our revisions to JJICRA. Um, and we just want to update and notify the board of um, the implementation of 2B of JJICRA to begin our 2.0 requirement after the distribution of first quarter report cards and to also uh, speak about the addition of formally putting the academic probation piece into play when the school year begins. So we have a quarterly minimum grade point average of 2.0 or a cumulative GPA of 2.0 for the previous four quarters and the same requirement that has been in place, no more than one grade below passing at our eligibility decision point. The implementation of the cumulative GPA for the previous four quarters allows a student who has uh, had one quarter that is below a 2.0 to have an opportunity to still maintain eligibility. And the implementation of students that have no more than one felon grade for the year will be put on academic probation. Uh, we've discussed this in the past, but that allows that student to stay a member of the team and participate in practice. They would not be allowed to travel. They could not compete, and they would be monitored by the coach as opposed to what we did previously, and that was just dismiss them from the team. 
Um, we talked here after doing a data analysis, and we just kind of looked at some worst case scenarios, so you'll see some data here. Um, I do want to indicate when we say worst case scenarios, there were uh, minimum squad sizes that we require schools to have in order to field a team. So um, when you see that, there could be a school who has a cross-country team of 10 members. If one appeared to be ineligible, they would have been flagged on this list, and that would have been concerning. There are also variables that we could not account for, the number of freshman participants that would be coming in the fall, which could definitely field out the rest of the team, but we just, that's information we could not predict for. So Ms. Bird, do you have any idea of, of the schools that, that you're referencing here, of the sports that they also might be cutting student athletes? So if you only have a bench roster of 10, but you have 15, could we ensure that those 10 that are selected, here, you know, say, say this one, they might lose their whole basketball team. Well, what about those the GPA of those other five that would have been cut if we would have, you know, if their GPA is 3-4, but maybe they're not as athletically inclined? <laughs> that I would agree, and that's another <laughs> variable that we could not account for, but there are some schools that have the luxury of um, making cuts, and then there are some in some areas. Um, I don't want to pick on schools, but we often tease, like a cross-country team kind of takes the members of other people that get cut. Sometimes everybody's just not as interested in cross-country, so they do get some people who may have been released from other teams, but those schools that have that luxury, that's correct. They may not be keeping their top choice, but just like we could not identify the freshmen that were coming out, there may be some people who would have been cut due to skill level, but they would be maintained to fill out a team. That is correct. So I would love to see a part of this policy regulation to include that. Um, okay. If you're cutting, that you have to document that those kids also would have been academically ineligible. Otherwise, cut your kids who might not, might be able to, or might not be able to play um, for academic reasons. Okay, we can uh, shift it. I'm not sure I understood that. So if, if I can only have 10 athletes mm -hmm. on my team, and oh crud, six of them are below a 2.0. Yes. So we're not gonna be able to field a team, but the other 20 that I cut were at a 3.5. I see, yeah. That maybe that means that we have to have- So you didn't mean a, cut players, you mean if you cut a team. Right, if not, we're gonna cut oh, a sorry, team- That's where I misunderstood Would we you. be able to field a team if we were willing to take different players or do an intramural option for I that see. school. I, I, thought, I understood you saying so that if kids can still be engaged and involved because we know engagement and involvement actually raises grades, not cutting yeah. kids from being able to play. But if you're also in a cutting situation, Cut for a team, how can we make considering sure cutting a team. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our minimums are just to make sure that we have viable teams um, that are participating so we aren't traveling and have a team that doesn't have enough to start. That's the, the purpose of our minimums. I would, I would like to see, I know we probably can't in this meeting, but I would like to see the 14, these 14 schools. Is that possible to do, to send the names of those schools to the board office? Yes, I believe that information can be um, provided, but we have started, and it appears that most schools, we have a survey out currently, uh, it's due back to us on Friday, and the schools listed are not expressing a problem because they have had those freshmen and other numbers um, come out, but we can provide the data. Information from earlier in the summer when, yes. the schools, when they hadn't started fielding their teams yet. Okay. With our academic probation piece, there will be a period of 20 school days where student athletes who have not met the initial eligibility requirements will have an opportunity to regain those and then participate in competitive play. Um, at this time, again, I've indicated they will be able to practice so they feel like they are a part of the team, but they cannot be issued any uniforms. As far as dance, that would be costuming or travel to the competitions. They will have an academic uh, advisor in place to help them with those supports, be placed on a contract to help improve their grades and then regain their full eligibility status. Does this impact any fall sports that might have competitions before the Labor Day 1 start day? It would um, it would have a, a impact in a situation where a student did not had, I'm sorry, with a student that had multiple failures, yes, um, but with the delayed implementation, that would not be an issue for other students. And during this time, again, we've uh, indicated that we've identified academic advisors for our schools. We also want to talk about earlier intervention, so we are um, 
requesting some shared service requests at every grade uh, distribution period to make sure we can identify other students that are struggling early. Um, we also have encouraged schools to hold interest meetings so we know those students that are interested so we're tracking them earlier. Um, and also with those progress report contracts, we have mandatory team study halls or coach classes, peer tutoring and mentoring, but the supports offered will vary by school based on the difference in size of staffs and what they have available to them. So when we were asked to provide kind of a student experience here, so if a student has more than one course failure, they would be declared ineligible to participate, but they could, through academic probation, become eligible. Um, in player B, if you have a GPA below a 2.0 with no more than one course failure, in um, the fall of 2018, the way the current regulation stood, you will be ineligible to participate. With the revisions, you could begin, um, and then the 2.0 requirement would be implemented fully at that quarter one report card. So in fall 2018, you are eligible to participate. And our next steps, um, uh, big communication, a robust plan to uh, notify our potential athletes, their families. Athletic directors have been very involved with this, coaches and principals, for outlining the upcoming changes. I've mentioned our quarterly tracking um, of data, early identification, improve our athletic eligibility education uh, during our seasons. It is still a shift for our students who have, for many of them, been used to having no more than one failure to talk about grade point averages, so we are talking about how those averages are calculated uh, also with their coaches to make sure that they truly understand how it's done and then also uh, remove uh, improve our communication with summer school remediation because some students have used that um, consistently to become eligible for fall athletics and then have referral forms for academic support from teachers as well We had a lot of collaboration uh, around um, these revisions. We worked with the Office of Teaching and Learning, Career and College Readiness. We had a focus group for principals, athletic directors, and students to get feedback on moving forward with these revisions. At this time, if there are any additional questions or comments. Uh, thank, thank you all for this uh, work. It's, it's really nice to see it. I have a concern, though, with the act. I think it's great for these academic advisors to be in every school. This, and I'm looking at policy JJJ now, dealing with the extracurricular activities. So these aren't the interscholastic um, and intrascholastic athletics. But when we think about the whole child and some equity for our other programs, I think it's important to kind of figure out a way um, to offer this academic advise, advising potentially to students and other extracurricular activities that may need support as well. To not just, um, and I think that it's great that we're looking at this policy and updating it, but when we think about all of our students that are participating in extracurricular, not just athletics, I think we should look at ways to, to um, supplement and enhance their academic improvement and eligibility for those programs as well. I would agree that's a very strong regulation. I believe we started here since those policies maintained that they could participate with no more than one failure, but we had the more rigorous process of a 2.0 requirement. But I do think that that is a very strong point, and thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, and, and I'd love to hear, Dr. Warren, how you're thinking about this as an incubator space for how do we do this for all kids, both to increase GPA, but also to get them more involved in other extracurricular activities. Um, because I, I see this as we're, we're really getting some good data, thank you Tiffany for your leadership on this, to now be able to make intentional decisions to get kids more engaged as well as to increase academic. So I don't know if, if your office has a plan for that, you want to give us a quick sneak peek on or? Um, no, I mean I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, that we have to look at going forward is just the resources and how we get this kind of capacity in place. Um, it, it's a significant lift, frankly, to do it just for the athletics program. Um, and we, in, in our conversations about getting this in place for athletics, we have had that discussion numerous times about everybody ought to have this opportunity. Um, and I wouldn't even limit it just to extracurriculars. Um, I think, you know, we know that our students 
um, need and I think in many cases really want that added, you know, sort of boost and support academically. Um, and so that has also opened up conversations about how we can improve our summer school programming. And so I think this is going to end up over time being um, a collaborative effort and conversation with the teaching and learning office um, as well as, as the whole child office. But, you know, I can't say that we've, we've solved it yet. Uh, another suggestion that I'd have that came out of this um, for, for you again, Tiffany, is looking at those schools that are really in jeopardy, whether it's these six or these eight um, or at, at risk, um, and, and focusing our inside out initiatives there. Because chances are good if they've got that low of academic performance team wide, they also may have some character and, and sort of sports personship challenges as well, that that partnership might be a really strong support for in elevating the academic scores, but also the athletics in general. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think that has been a conversation with the with the team working on the Inside Out initiative that they knew they know we're implementing this. They know about the academic coaches, so it's definitely been a, a conversation about how do we leverage that partnership to make sure that um, that some of those supports are particularly focused on um, on schools that are struggling and um, that Inside Out work you know with the athletic directors and the coaches. How are they thinking about these requirements and, and ensuring their students have the capacity to meet these requir requirements as they're thinking about about that building out of the more um, character development aspect of sports. So I, I wouldn't say we have a specific way that we're partnering on that yet, but it's definitely been part of our conversation with them. Uh, and then regarding the actual regulation, um, on page two, letter D, um, it says on the day that report cards are issued. I'm wondering if we don't need to say on the date report cards are required to be issued. Uh, especially fall report cards, will come in right about fall tournament time. And I could easily see a head football coach in the best of his or her intentions saying, Principal Berkeley, can you hang on to those report cards for a week so we can play in this tournament? So, so setting a schedule report cards either on a date or within a window of within six days of the end of, of each quarter, report cards will be released. Um, Again, to help support the principal so they don't get put in that bad position of having to look at Coach Berkeley and say, yeah, no, I'm not going to. Well, then our entire team will be ineligible or, yeah, so just, just as a protective, as well as the protective so people can anticipate that I got to get my stuff in by this date or it won't, or it won't work for us. Um, and we have flagged that, or at least I know my office has. Even the window um, sometimes makes it tough because it's a little bit inconsistent since we're not all doing it on the same day. Um, but we did not control that window. And I honestly think coaches would be more in support of knowing that because there are also situations, and I've experienced it as an athletic director, that you've practiced and worked with a kid all week who you cannot use in a Friday contest because you didn't have the report card issue. So I think it, it's also on the other side as well that we would prefer a more tight window, but we do adhere to the, the district's window. And this year we are sending out a request on that final day to be notified if there are any schools who have not yet distributed report cards. So I do think that that's a, a great point that you make and we should continue to work about how do we tighten that up so it's within academics like when do we issue a specific date do we say do we um, to your point say that x number of days after the quarter ends that the report card goes out but I do think tightening that up to give that clarity for the reasons that you're both mentioning is really important so if we can continue to do that before it goes to the um, you know as as we continue to implement this policy I think we're learning a lot as we implement this policy yes. and um, um, I think, you know, we're we're putting in the supports to make sure that it has the desired results, which is not to deny kids opportunities, but to actually use sports and other activities as an as an incentive to have students more engaged and have them um, want to be at school and 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 then um, bringing their grades up and um, learning the content more effectively. So I think that that's one way that we should be thinking about the implications of this and making sure that we're tightening up our processes so that there's not this kind of gray area that could be taken advantage of in either direction. Thank you. Yes, and please let me know if there are any other data points. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. All right, um, Mr. Kent, do we have any public comment today? Well, nobody signed up in advance. All right. Anybody in the gallery just dying to chit-chat with us? <laughs> Going once. I just want to introduce myself. 
why don't you come to the mic, sir, so we can capture your voice. And introduce yourself in three or less minutes. And they don't have the timer up, so I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Joseph Kane. Um, I'm a board member of PCAB, and I will probably be taking over the policy committee for PCAB. So I just want to introduce myself today. Nice so. to meet you. Mr. Kane, happy to chat with you at any point. No and we're very happy to have Mr. Kane as part of the um, PCAB leadership board. So, And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come to policy committee and taking it seriously enough, your role in PCAB, that you want to be here when it comes um, uh, when we're meeting at the, with the board. So thank you so much. I mean, uh, Mr. Kane is a very engaged parent, um, and so we're appreciative to have him here. So thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, thank and you and a second set of shout outs of appreciation to our technical staff and and city and CEO staff who changed this meeting for us. Uh, we have a really important ribbon cutting this afternoon for two of our buildings, uh, two buildings that had a lot of community engagement around shifting. And we want to show up in Cherry Hill this afternoon in, in order to be able to do that and honor that community. We needed to shift this meeting. So thank you to everybody who worked double duty um, to make that shift happen. And now there's still time for everybody to go get ice cream there is. and dance. Uh, but before, so. we come, before we officially adjourn, mm -hmm. uh, I'll remind you that our next meeting is September 18th, back at the 3.30 to 5.30 timetable in this room, where we will be talking about policy JLA, which is test integrity, and EBCD, which is delayed openings and emergency closings of schools. One question for the chief of staff before we go. Um, many people in the community have been asking me, to which department was the equity work assigned? Do you know that answer? So we are working right now on hiring our equity director um, position. So we are doing interviews in the next two weeks for that. So that will be the office that is a new position that will be reporting to the CEO. And that's where the equity leadership work uh, will work, will, will happen. In the meantime, we've had a core team group that, we, that meets regularly that we kind of take on issues that we look on over an extended period of time. And our current focus is equity. So that's a group that's made up of leadership leaders from um, academic from all departments okay excellent thank you all right with that at 12 41 p.m we are adjourned thank you very much everyone